All right, I'm going to uh, experiment today using, I'm going to use this instead of chalk. So I haven't done that before, but Professor Butters thinks it'll come up better with the camera, but so we'll, we'll see how it works. Um, first of all, um, pr uh, Praxis is, yes, it's, this is the, um, this is the Praxis event, uh, and it's going to be on Wednesday, 7 p.m. Lane 125. Okay, so we got Lane 125. Does that look better than the chalk, or does it matter? Sort of indifferent. Okay. Well, we'll we'll play with this today. Um, anyway, uh, this is the uh, um, who's going to be here is David Hebert, who is a 2009 graduate. He's a professor at Aquinas College, um, and uh, anyway, he's going to be speaking on um, private problems and public choice. And uh, so he's going to be talking about all the uh, problems that. Uh, that there is in regard to elections and um, have we been picking, are there different ways to pick pan candidates? Uh, and so he says, um, uh, has uh, government overstepped its bounds and is trying to solve problems that it actually cannot solve? Um, public choice provides a framework for thinking about this. And uh, anyway, that's uh, going to be uh, Professor uh, Hebert's talk is going to be about can government actually solve the problems that they're all talking about solving when, they're run, when people are running for election. And of course, we have an election coming up that sort of an interesting election. So um, by the way, uh, I just, uh, a friend of mine, Steve Mitchell, has a, has a polling firm. And he just released a poll today for Michigan. And uh, Biden's, ahead by, um, Biden's ahead by 10% in Michigan right now, uh, according, to his, according to his poll. Uh, and um, yeah, Senator Peters, the incumbent, in the, who's a Democrat in the Senate seat, is ahead by 6%. So again, polling is difficult in, uh, in this kind of environment. Uh, but anyway, just uh, FYI. Um, also, when you look at the national polls, um, of course, they don't really matter because you could be ahead by 6 million votes in California. And uh, you could be ahead by, you know, your opponent could be ahead by five votes in Florida. And, you know, if Florida and California have similar amount of electoral college votes, then it doesn't really matter what the national poll is showing. So you can sort of ignore the national polling data. What you really want to know is what's going on in the 12 battleground states, the, what they call battleground states, the swing states. Um, all right. Um, band pick of the week, which I forgot to do last week, but I'm giving you the band pick of the week for this week. See, okay, I really don't like that. Is Wallows. That's a little better. W A L L O W S. Anybody know? Have you ever heard of them? They're, a, they're an indie rock band. They're out of uh, Los Angeles. That's a trio. Um, they just they started in 2017, I believe, and they just signed with Atlantic Records. So uh, you might want to just get on YouTube and look up Wallows and uh, take a listen to them. They have a song called Pleaser that was, uh, that was their first hit or semi-hit. So anyway, you might want to take a Wallows. Um, then... I forgot to bring in the classic album of the week um, last Friday, but it's Van Morrison's Astral Weeks. Um, anybody heard of this at all? Okay, yeah, I got one. Um, Van Morrison, uh, you know, he's, Brown Eyed Girl was his, his first big hit. Um, this was uh, his second album in uh, 1968, uh, and um, probably uh, Sweet Things and um, uh, ballerina, Slim Soul Slider, some, th some interesting songs on this one. Okay, everybody's sort of heard of the, the uh, um, Brown Eyed Girl, but um, 
You might want to take a listen to Van Morrison's second album, a Astral Weeks. All right, 1968. Okay. Um, last time we were talking uh, about, you know, we're finishing up the, the overall picture of tort liability. So now we're going to again um, look at just particular topics in tort liability. Look at some things in a little more detailed fashion for some things that we hadn't really thought about. So um, let's, we're going to start out looking at some of the um, economic assumptions, right? You, you, we, you always start out. So we just, if we had to look at topics here, um, one of the assumptions that you might want to talk about is rationality, right? We assume that everybody's rational, and so what are they doing? They're trying to set the, remember the, that's what they were trying to do, right? They were trying to set the marginal cost of precaution equal to the marginal benefit of precaution. Marginal cost of precaution said that, you know, if X is the amount of precaution and we just use a simple model where X, that, you know, there's a, a, a constant marginal cost to uh, additional precaution and we just have some uh, cost here or, or the A was the, the, uh, the, uh, the cost of the accident or whatever, you're going to try to set the marginal social cost equal to the reduction in the uh, expected value of the loss, right? But um, what if you make predictable errors? So if we think, okay, I don't like this at all. I'm going back. Back to the, going back to chalk. What if they make predictable errors? Right? That is, how many have had uh, taken behavioral economics class with Professor Clark? Okay, some of you have. All right, so this is really sort of this issue of behavioral economics, which we brought up a little bit at the beginning of class. Um, and what if it turns out that people underestimate low probability events? So they underestimate low probability events. Like maybe you just think the probability is zero, right? You don't think that this, you know, this, this happens so infrequently that you under, maybe you think there's a 2% chance of this happening when there's really a 10% chance of this happening. And it turns out that people tend to do that. They tend to, they tend to underestimate the probability that something's going to happen if it's low probability. Then what will happen, uh, they'll take too little precaution, right? Because they're getting the P prime of X wrong, right? So they're undertaking too little precaution. Or what if you overestimate, you might overestimate the probability, we'll call, you over overestimate the probability of low probability events if they show up in the paper a lot or there's a lot of, uh, a, a lot of publicity about it. So they overestimate low probability events that get a lot of attention. It turns out that People do that. If you, um, if what happens is, I mean, what if you had a, uh, uh, the probability of dying from uh, COVID, okay? Uh, and let's say the probability of, I mean, what, what do we know? Like, um, how many have died in the United States? Is like, anybody know? 4,000, 5,000? How much is it? Oh, well, okay, died from, whatever, whatever the, the, the numbers they're showing you. Is it 200,000? 200, okay. So if you look at what's the probability of, there's how many people in the United States? 336 million, right? So the probability of you dying of COVID is 
relatively small, right? Even if, even if you had 300, let's say you had 300,000, uh, what's that, 1% of 300, what's, what is, what is 300,000 of 300 million? Oh, come on, we can figure that out, right? <laughs> What, what is that in percentage? If, got, if we have 300,000 divided by 300 million, right? So what is that? 1%? 0.1%. Okay? So we got 0.1%. So the chance of you dying of COVID is relatively low if you're actually dying of it, right? But if it's on the news every day, then what happens is you overestimate that probability, right? And, so, and what happens is the news tends to, um, if there's an airplane crash, okay? If there's an airplane crash, what do you hear? I mean, it's all over the news, right? So people may think the probability of an airplane crashing is higher than it otherwise is. So what's gonna happen? Then you're also, if you're overestimated, you're gonna take too much precaution. Right? So the, the, in either case, you're going to get a, uh, uh, you, uh, you won't get a minimization of the total, uh, the total social cost, right? That's what you're trying to do. So um, if you have the first case whereby people tend to underestimate the probability of low probability events, one way that you could deal with that is that you could have a uh, liability rule where the producer gets the liability, right? So if you wanted to take care of this underestimating the probability, then you'd have the producer get the liability, right? You'd have a strict liability rule on the producer, and then what would happen? Well, the producer would fix, would, would uh, make the power tool so that the the, the proper amount of precaution was built into the price of the power tool, okay? So uh, if, if, if you guys don't really, you're, you're underestimating the chance that you're gonna uh, cut yourself with a chainsaw because you don't know exactly what the probability is, but I as the producer have a better handle on what that probability is, then what, then what will happen is we'll embed that into the cost of producing the the, uh, uh, the chainsaw, and we'll get the proper amount of precaution, okay? So, um, again, these are just topics to think about. You know, if you, you know, are, are people really rational, which we've assumed, if they're not, then maybe the law ought to be structured to, to take into account that people on their own will either overestimate or they'll underestimate things happening. Second, second topic is what about regulation? Right, in regulation what, you, that, what you're trying to do is you're trying to reduce the hazard before it happens, right? You wanna, you wanna, to, do you wanna correct the hazard before it happens, and so what, what, what could you do? A regulator uh, could require, let's say require um, uh, smoke alarms uh, in, you know, uh, in um, hotels, right? I mean, that's the sort of thing you'd do. You'd have a, uh, if you have a, um, the regulator may know more about what the proper precaution is than you, the individuals, are. And so, um, and, and you may have, so then the question would become, who's gonna be the regulator? That is, would you have the court decide what the proper precaution is, right? I mean, that's really what you're doing. You're, you're picking out what, somebody's deciding what X star is, uh, and so the regulator, who might be the, the uh, uh, administrator of some, um, you know, uh, some government agency, um, they would decide here's what the, the uh, amount of enforcement you have. Now, um, 
you could allow the regulators to decide, right? So you'd have some sort of uh, administrative official or administration decides. Um, why might that happen? That might happen because they have the technical expertise. Maybe they know, because they're dealing with this stuff all the time, uh, they may be uh, knowledgeable about here's what the proper amount of caution ought to be. Here's the proper amount of proper precaution. You ought to build this, if you, in fact, if you start a restaurant, um, you have to have all these, uh, um, all these regulations on what you have to have in a restaurant. You have to have a, a certain kind of, uh, uh, you know, fire alarm, or you got to have a, uh, let's say if you have a, a child care a facility, you have to have certain rules about here's what you have to have if you have a child care facility. And so the, the, the idea is that the regulator uh, has a um, more, has technical expertise, and, they, they, and so what you could set the law up that the administrator decides. You have the, uh, the you know, the, uh, uh, in the, at Hillsdale, you know, Hillsdale City, they, um, you have the person that's in charge of, um, of uh, uh, planning and zoning. Can, they, can, they can decide, here's what you have to have if you're going to have a restaurant, or here's what you have to have if you're going to have a, uh, an apartment upstairs uh, in the downtown area. So they'll have, uh, they'll have the ability to decide what's going to be, uh, what, what's going to be the standard. Uh, and so you'd have some sort of standard and that would allow you to avoid a fine. Remember we said that we could, what we could do is you could punish people for not, the, uh, uh, not meeting the standard by compensating people that get injured. Uh, or you might have a fine or you might have both. So you might be able to avoid a fine or avoid compensation. Right. That is, this is your uh, this, this this is your liability rule um, where you have. Remember that this is sort of your negligence rule. You, if you meet the the, the regulator is going to decide. Here's what the proper precaution is. Here's what X star is. If you if you meet X star, you, we're not going to fine you, and you are not liable. Okay. And so the, it's really discussing. You know, when we were talking about negligence, it's really discussing who, who, who can make the X star, who decides what the proper amount of precaution is. You could have an administrator do it, or you could have the courts do it. Right? I could make the law so that the courts are going to decide individually, you come in, you sue, and then what happens? Your attorney explains, you know, you, you get injured, your attorney explains why this other person was negligent, that is, they didn't take the proper amount of precaution, okay? Uh, my attorney uh, tries to, you know, I caused the injury, my attorney's trying to demonstrate um, that this was proper precaution, and we have lots of these lawsuits, and so over time, what happens is the courts uh, begin to figure this out, um, and so you might have the courts decide. The courts are going to decide what X star is, right? By uh, uh, by looking at individual cases. So again, when you're structuring the law, you're going to say, you know, okay, there's going to be, we're going to allow the uh, uh, Department of Environmental Quality determine uh, whether you can put this stuff into the groundwater or not, okay? Or we could have, because remember when we looked at the, on the midterm, uh, talking about um, if I put fertilizer on the ground, you know, then it leaks into your groundwater or into your well, right? What, what should be happening here in terms of a, a, an accident? And so if we're looking at tort law and we're saying, I want you to take proper precaution, then the question is, who, which do you think in this particular instance is more likely to get you to the right X star? 
right? That may be a, uh, a situation where, yeah, the administrators know a lot about this stuff, they're, they're experts, uh, and they're more likely to get it than it is with a bunch of us all suing each other and our attorneys trying to show what it looks like. But it might be a situation where court proceedings over time, right, we've developed some sort of common law and we've had lots of, uh, we've had lots of court cases on this thing that we say, okay, you can look to the, to the courts to decide. Uh, and so again, it's not to give you exactly, here's what we ought to do, but to give you, let's say, what's the direction that we ought to be headed. One of the thing about regulations, though, is if you've had Econ 415, you can get rent seeking. And what is rent seeking? Rent seeking is where individuals use the political process to try to uh, gain rent, gain economic rent. That is to try to get economic profit out of the, out of the system. So let's suppose that you uh, are a maker of fire alarms, okay? If you're a maker of fire alarms, what would you like to have? You'd like to have the administrator go out and say, okay, everybody that has a, um, has a rental apartment or anybody that rents their house has to have a fire, or Airbnb, right? That anybody does that uh, uses Airbnb has to have a, uh, has to have a fire alarm, okay? So uh, if you, when you have the uh, administration making what the proper precaution ought to be, you just have to realize that you are going to induce um, people to use that, that system to try to make themselves better off. That is, they're gonna have the regulation in excess of what X star is in order to make money on, the, on, on, on their particular uh, item that they're gonna require you to, to, to have. Well, the next little topic would be, what about, how, let, let's have some comments on insurance. Again, these are just um, uh, points to, um, to sort of think about when you're making or indicating what the law might be like. Um, what happened, a person buys insurance, we talked about that, right? If you have diminishing margin utility of income, uh, then you would prefer uh, a uh, item with certainty uh, that has a lower expected value to something with uh, a, a higher expected value but has uncertainty to it. So we said that, okay, there's a demand for insurance and then there'll be a supply of insurance and, and uh, you can use the law of large numbers to figure out what the premiums might be. Um, so how does it usually work? Well, when you buy insurance, you file a claim with the insurance company. So there's a car accident, you have car, you have, you have car insurance, what happens? you file a claim with your insurance company. When that happens, insurance usually transfers the right to sue the injurer to the insurance company. Okay, so it transfers the right to sue the injurer to the insurance company. And that makes sense because the insurance company has provided you with the compensation, right? So the insurance company provides you with the compensation and you turn over to the insurance company the right to sue the person that, that injured you. Now you can buy things, you can buy insurance, uh, or excuse me, you can sue for things that aren't covered by your insurance, okay? So maybe something happened that wasn't covered by insurance, you can go ahead and sue for that. But it doesn't make, you can see that it makes sense that the insurance company, since they compensated you, they get the right to sue the person that uh, had uh, a, uh, that caused the accident. Now, you can buy insurance against liability. Right? You can buy insurance Anybody in here ever bought car insurance? Not too many, okay. Well, if you buy car insurance, one of the things that you're gonna buy is the liability. 
that is you're insuring if you cause an accident and somebody ends up in the hospital, what are you, you're buying from your insurance company uh, a, uh, that, you, that they will pay the compensation that you would have had to make, okay? And so you can buy up to, um, actually there's a, um, some, it depends on the state how they set it up, uh, but there may be a minimum of liability that you have to buy. Um, and anyway, your premiums will be affected obviously by how much of the liability that you're passing on to the insurance company. So, uh, a so uh, basically car insurance works where you can buy insurance against liability. And so if we sort of think back to what we were trying to do with tort law, right? You're trying to minimize the, the you're trying to minimize the social cost of accidents. Right? And, and that includes the administrative costs. Right? Well, if you sort of think about it, what if you had universal insurance, that is, everybody had insurance and full compensation. You had universal insurance and you had comp competitive markets. So, if you had universal insurance competitive markets, what do we know from Econ 202, right? Competitive markets, right, profit equals zero. So in a competitive market, then what would happen is, if you, if you sort of think about it, the insurance companies um, would have the, uh, um, the insurance companies would make zero profit, right? They wouldn't make economic losses. Um, but they wouldn't make economic profit. So what would happen? You'd expect that the premiums plus the, um, the premiums plus the, uh, uh, the administration, administrative costs of doing it would be equal to zero, right? Um, it's sort of like a, 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 a the, the, the premiums, the, well, okay. Let me put it this way. The premiums should equal the claims, right? The premiums uh, should equal the claims plus the administrative, plus the administrative costs, okay? So if, the, if, if there were no administrative costs to run in the, my insurance company, what, and, and we had competitive markets, and everybody was out there uh, with, uh, you know, the, uh, buying, the, buying insurance, what would happen is, the premiums would equal the claims because you know, we got a competitive market here, but there's some administration cost to doing it. So what ought to happen? The premiums ought to equal the, I wrote that very poorly, but the, the premium should equal what? The claims plus the administrative costs, right? That's what ought to, yeah. Well, that's going to be part of the administrative cost, right? I mean, I, I, got, I got to have a cost to running my insurance company, and that which is outside of the, 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 uh, the, uh, the expected losses that are going to happen. So the idea is that my, whatever the administrative costs are to running the insurance company are going to be uh, built into here. And so what ought to happen is that the, 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 the premiums ought to equal the cost of the, uh, of the claims plus administrative costs. And so um, if we sort of think about that, that looks much like a, um, the, the insurance companies have taken over the tort situation. That is what, happen, what would be happening here if you had universal claims, excuse me, universal uh, insurance and you had competitive markets, then Everything would be being done in the in the privatization of the of the tort system, effectively, right? You have effective uh, 
to have an effective privatization of tort law. Because what would happen is the insurance companies, they'd settle with one another. So effectively, um, the, the insurance companies are going to resolve the disputes among themselves. And the social cost would be minimized in the sense that the expected losses would be equal to the, the premiums plus whatever the, the or excuse me, the expected losses plus the administrative costs would be equal to the premiums. And so you would have essentially all the uh, authors here are trying to do is to show that there is a, um, when you, when you have the uh, uh, insurance companies ha having the uh, compensating you and you giving up your right to sue the injured, the injurer uh, to the insurance company and you can buy insurance against compensation so that you are transferring your risks over to the insurance companies, then what will happen is you have, in a sense, a, a privatization of, of tort law. Um, and of course, there's car insurance is, is, is sort of the more obvious example of that, uh, where you're buying, you know, when you buy car insurance, you, you buy insurance against uh, against uh, uh, a cost to you from somebody uh, crashing into you, but you also buy insurance against your causing damage to somebody else, and you give up your right to sue to the insurance companies, and then the insurance companies, they, uh, they make decisions and, and they uh, uh, work, within, uh, work within, it, within the system uh, to, uh, to settle the disputes among themselves. So, just just a comment that um, tort, the, the, there's a somewhat, you can sort of think about it as somewhat of a privatization of, of the tort law under, uh, under the insurance system. And particularly, it's noticeable in, in, in car insurance. Does that make, make sense? Okay, so you got, yeah. I mean, it's not, yeah, it's not like Nobel Prize thoughts here. Um, it's just, just an, again, th these, these are mainly observations that are going on. Now, um, suppose that you don't have universal, uh, in, uh, universal insurance coverage. Um, suppose that people choose to buy their insurance, right? You don't require them to buy insurance. What, what do we have under the Affordable Care Act, right? You have to buy insurance, okay? Um, but suppose that, that that's not the case. Suppose that it's just regular insurance. What if you had a law of st strict liability? If you had a law of strict liability, then what would happen is the potential injurer, and of course this is exactly like uh, what we were uh, talking about before. Um, if you have strict liability, then you, you would buy insurance if you were a, a potential injurer. You know, if we're trying to make this connection between how the insurance company is somewhat of a moving of the tort system into the, into the, the, the private sector, okay? Um, if you had a law that had strict liability, then why would you ever buy uh, insurance uh, if you were uh, a potential, uh, uh, potential victim, right? You, you wouldn't buy insurance, right? Potential victim wouldn't buy. which is what we were talking about before, right? That is under strict liability, if there's no insurance going on, right? Under strict liability, what would happen is that 
you're not going to take proper precaution as a potential victim, right? Because you know you're going to be comp fully compensated by the person that injured. So it's the same deal, right? Rather than talking about precaution, we're talking about buying insurance, okay? So under a law of strict liability, then, then anybody that's a potential victim uh, isn't going isn't to buy insurance, okay? So it's, it's a, if you can sort of think of insurance as being, in some sense, as being your precaution, right? Uh, you're, you're not going to buy insurance under a, under a strict liability. Now, I have, as a potential injurer, I have the incentive to buy insurance. Yeah? Doesn't that assume that the uh, person to whom the strict liability applies to is like judgment proof, otherwise it's capable by law? I mean, like people, rich people pay uh, kidnapping insurance, and they're the victims. And the reason why is because you'll never be able to bring a suit against your kidnapper and actually recover the images. Yeah, and we'll we're going to come to that in a moment. Well, what, what, what happens if, you, um, if, the, if the party that you can sue, uh, they, they can't pay, right? What, and, and just, well, just jumping ahead, uh, bankruptcies like that, right? If you, if you have bankruptcy laws, uh, what, what will that do? It means that I know that you can't sue me for more than a certain amount, otherwise I'll declare bankruptcy. Uh, and so that, yeah, wh whether you can uh, collect from the, uh, the party that might injure you is also something to be, to be thinking about. And that's why we're gonna, when we talk about, in a moment, we're gonna talk about joint and several liability. That's what that tries to deal with. All right, so, but if you, so if you have no liability, Right? You're going to get a very similar thing that we did before in terms of precaution. And if you can just sort of think about as buying insurance, uh, you part of what your precaution is. Again, the real precaution we're talking about is do you undertake activities to, re to reduce the chance of the accident happening? Right? That's, that's the precaution. You know. When you buy insurance, you're not doing it. That, that you're, you're not reducing the chance of your having the accident. You're reducing the chance of you having to pay. Okay? But the point that we're making here is that it's a very similar thing. That is, are you going to buy insurance is similar to the idea of, are you going to take proper precaution in order to avoid the accident from happening? Okay? So again, Buying insurance is not changing X, right? But the point is still the same. If I have a strict liability law or I have a no liability law, it's going to affect how the insurance industry works. And uh, if you have a no liability law, then what are you going to have is that um, potential injurers won't buy insurance. So again, just making the point that um, the, the, you can, you can uh, see how the insurance industry uh, can uh, uh, is sort of a private, in some sense, a, a privatization of the, of the tort law, where it moves it out of the courts and into the insurance companies, uh, and they're the ones that, uh, that settle with one another. Um, and of course, just as uh, you might have then administrators deciding what X star is, um, when you are uh, suing somebody or somebody's suing you, you could have the administrators or the courts, they're deciding what the, 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 the efficient amount of precaution is. What would you have here? You'd have the insurance companies making, uh, making it so that if you, um, uh, if you're going to get insurance, you're going to have to do this, that, or the other thing. If you're going to insure your restaurant uh, against um, somebody suing you for, uh, you know, they, they got sick from something that you cooked, okay, then they may say, okay, you have to have this kind of oven, right? Or uh, you have to have this amount of cleanliness or whatever. So if you have no liability, uh, or strict liability, in either case, the insurance companies may impose standards um, 
uh, effectively may effectively regulate by requiring things to, to get the insurance. Right? So the insurance companies can, can again, sort of looking at the comparison of, of insurance with tort law, the insurance companies sort of become the regulators in that sense. That is, they, they, when you go to buy insurance, you got to have this, that, or the other thing. Uh, and your premium, or, or you can't get the insurance, right? Or your premiums may be different if you, uh, if you do this, that, or the other thing. Now, um, again, in, in when, if you look at the consumer goods, in the consumer goods industry, um, insurance companies may get a better idea of the problems with uh, products, if we look at consumer goods industry, then what might happen is that the insurance companies can keep track of who's, uh, uh, what, what manufacturer isn't doing a very good job, right? So insurance companies can figure out um, what manufacturers are doing proper precaution? And what will they do? They'll charge lower premiums, right? Or charge higher premiums for those that tend to have a, um, uh, and, and, and they will uh, charge premiums to account for that. So that if you have a consumer product industry, uh, you guys uh, may not know that that particular manufacturer doesn't do a very good job. But if I'm an insurance company and I've dealt with 100 cases where people that have bought insurance from me that you know they keep having to you know the, 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 there's there's a problem then I will I'll go oh yeah this manufacturer isn't very good right and so what's going to happen is I'm going to charge them a higher premium because they don't they know that they're not as uh, don't have as high a quality product or tend to have more more problems with their product and so again the insurance companies may be able to find out more information than you as the individual consumer and so then the consumer the, the, the consumer product industry will tend, remember what, one, one of the things that we said is that you might want to have the, if, if you guys uh, um, don't know very much about chainsaws, uh, then maybe we want to have the strict liability with the chainsaw manufacturer, right? Uh, similarly here, what might happen is in the consumer products industry, the insurance companies are better, better able to say, ah, this, this company doesn't do a very good job, or this company does a better job and affect the premiums, or just not, they just won't insure a particular company, okay? So again, um, if the, uh, again, you, you, when, when you think about, you may get more precaution than the consumers want. I, the insurance company, may prefer to have a certain level of precaution, whereas you, the consumer, may not want that much precaution, and so you end up with a, uh, a more costly product. But um, uh, that the, the consumers may not want as much precaution as you, the insurance company, does. Okay? So it's possible that what would happen then is that you'd get more precaution than, than the consumers might want. So the point here is just that insurance will uh, look similar to the, um, to the tort system. Uh, and in some sense, there's a, a uh, privatization of the, of, the of the tort system in an insurance uh, market. And you'll get similar things going on uh, as you start to think through 
um, what, what, uh, what, what the potential victim's gonna look like and who's gonna buy insurance and who's not gonna buy insurance depending on what the law looks like. All right, um, that leads us to what Con sort of what Conrad was talking about. We'll talk more about it next time with vicarious liability, et cetera. Um, but what happens if you have bankruptcy laws? Right. If you have if you have a bankruptcy law, then what will happen is that you can escape liability by declaring bankruptcy, or you escape full liability. Maybe they get part of what you have, but you escape full liability by declaring bankruptcy. Well, then obviously you'll get less than efficient precaution. Right? So if I'm able to declare bankruptcy, I am, I, I'm going to re, uh, reduce the compensation that you may have to pay, and so I'll end up with uh, uh, precaution below the optimal amount. So when you, again, these laws are all interconnected. Uh, and when you're, when you're just looking at bankruptcy law, you might want to figure out uh, how does that bankruptcy law affect torts, okay? How does it affect the precaution that, that people would take? So when you're, you know, if you're working for uh, a state senator or you're working for a uh, state rep or you are a state rep or state senator, uh, when these laws are coming up, uh, this is just to give you some uh, th a thought process to, to work through what, what you might want to be talking about when you're putting the law together. And then a last point is to, to think about here before we go to um, uh, whether we're going to have vicarious liability, something that, that Conrad was, was, was looking at, is to look at litigation costs. How does litigation costs affect people's behavior? How do they affect behavior? Well, if, if litigation costs are high, I mean, you have to, fit, you have to sort of put this into the uh, uh, tort liability. If, if litigation costs are high, that figures out into the administrative costs for one. And again, Michigan is one of 12 states that have a, um, uh, that have uh, 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 no fault insurance. Okay, what, what does that do? It reduces the cost of litigation. And, and what is that? That you're reducing the administrative costs of the, uh, of the insurance industry uh, in, in, in Michigan. And so um, you have to figure that out or figure administrative costs into the, the tort liability. And of course, if it's costly, you get fewer suits. Right? And that means you'll get less precaution. If the chances are you getting sued are lower because, well, if I got to sue you, I got to hire an attorney and it's really expensive. And so, um, you know, the, the, there'll, be the, there'll be fewer, fewer chances that you as the injurer are going to get sued. Then what's going to happen? You're going to take less precaution. But, You may take more precaution to avoid the cost if someone does sue you. So you got to sort of think, think about which direction that's going. That is, if I cause an injury and I get sued, and it's really expensive, just the suit part of it's really expensive, then the, the, the loss to me of having to go through with that means that I'm gonna take more precaution. But on the other hand, it's less likely that somebody's gonna sue me. So I'll take less precaution. So you gotta sorta, you gotta sorta think through both sides of, of, that, of that issue. All right? Um, 
What we'll do for uh, Wednesday is we're, uh, it's the, the section's called Extend Basic Models. Uh, we're going to look at, basically we're going to look at vicarious liability and uh, joint liability. And we should probably get through um, this chapter and then we'll start chapters eight and nine uh, uh, dealing with uh, contract law, all right? So if you want to look ahead a little bit, start looking at, at contract law.